I had a, a C extension for the first time, and there were some passages with one bass and, and one cello, and I had to play the low C, and it was totally out of tune with the cello. And it was it was shocking how awful it was. And I thought, well, I tuned my my C extension to a tuner. It's uh, it should be in tune. Well, but then I thought, okay, well, let's think how the the fellow with with the cello tuned his C. Well, he tuned it against his G and made a nice fifth, in which he had tuned against his his D and made a nice fifth, and so on. So, I just moved the nut on that C extension quite a bit lower, so it had sounded nice against my open G, and then the problem was solved. Today's guest is a super cool guy that I've been hoping to have on the podcast for some time. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting with Joel Reist, who is principal bass of the Nashville Symphony, teaches at Vanderbilt University at the Blair School of Music, does a host of other things that we get into in this show, and he's had a great path through the music world. We talk about where he grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania and going to Carnegie Mellon, studying with Tony Bianco, then Paul Ellison, his path through the New World Symphony and ultimately to Nashville, where he's been for the last almost 20 years. We also talk about what getting a new hall does for an orchestra, how to play orchestral pizzicatos better, and all sorts of great topics about mindset and tone and you name it. It's a wide-ranging and fascinating conversation. I had a great time. I know you will, too. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, Robertson & Sons, Upton Bass, Diderio Strings, and A440. You'll hear more from them later in the show. But let's dig into this conversation with Nashville Symphony principal bassist, Joel Reist. Morning, Jason. Hey, Joel. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Just back back in San Francisco. I was on a on a couple different trips, and I was actually hanging out with two Nashville Luthiers, uh, Randy Hunt and Dustin yeah. Williams. Both great guys who have yeah. helped me out many, many times. I'm sure you were having a good time if you were hanging out with them. Yeah, it was it was really cool. Randy is making this bass he's been working on for a while and it's his beautiful instrument i i forget what the wood is but it's this really interestingly figured wood mm -hmm. yeah so that was that cool. was a cool cool event cool to be a fly on the wall and see i think 22 different luthiers from around the world and just like chatting about different tone woods and showing each other different designs and it's really really a fascinating event was arnold there oh yeah arnold was there yeah you're fam familiar with arnold i'm sure Oh yeah, I I have one of his bases and I absolutely love it. Um, it's funny how I how I found that base. I was visiting my wife's family in New Jersey, and I had a conversation previously uh, with Scott Pingle, and I was just kind of picking his brain because I needed to upgrade my equipment. I was playing on an RV at the time, and this would have been. Oh gosh, almost 20 years ago, maybe early 2000s, 15 years ago maybe. And uh, Scott had told me about Arnold, and I had a conversation with him at, at some point. So I'm up in New Jersey, and uh, I somehow found out that a guy named Jonathan Stork had a uh, Arnold Schnitzer base and didn't live too far away from my wife's family. So I called Ar – uh, uh, Jonathan up and I said, Hey, can I check out your bass, your Schnitzer bass at some point? Because I, I might want to commission an instrument from this guy. So I met up with him and I played the bass for just a few minutes at a break in rehearsal, of New Jersey Symphony. And I loved it, loved it right away. And I told him, If you ever sell this bass, let me know. <laughs> well, a funny thing happened because of about Nine months later, I got a call from him, and he said, well, you said to call you if I ever sold this bass. And it turns out my my uh, my old teacher passed away, and his widow wants to sell me his, his Prescott. Uh, and 
you know, I need to sell the schnitzer. So we made it happen. And about three months after that, we had the, uh, the Nashville Symphony principal bass audition. And I know that that, that bass made a, a big difference in, in the way I was able to uh, present myself. Oh, uh, it, wow. It, it, <laughs> yeah, it just has a, a, a wonderful tone, especially in uh, – well, just a great sounding bass, but kind of in, in the register where you play a lot of the orchestral solos like Hinostera and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It was just perfectly set up, sounded great, and just uh, love it. Oh, that's great! Wow. Well, I'm sure I'm sure Arnold will appreciate hearing that too. And and what what a what a great guy and and uh, interesting thinker. Uh, and one of my former students uh, is playing on a Schnitzer bass, and he was looking for some instruments, you know, getting into six figure range. So they did a behind the behind the screen test. Uh, in Chicago with some of the CSO players and the Schnitzer bass came out ahead in terms of tone. Uh, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, great, uh, great maker for sure. And I love that ergonomic bass. I, you probably, that's probably not the model you have, but have you seen that bass of his? I have seen it and it is, it's fascinating. It's not the model that I have, but, uh, mm-hmm. but very intriguing and great idea. And from, you know, I've, I've, noodle around on a couple and they sound they sound great they Mm -hmm. sound great well it's it's just cool like like i I love that people are so willing to experiment in the bass world and like hang out with those luthiers for a few days just confirmed that there it's it it's such a different mindset uh to me than maybe the violin world is i mean willing to kind of like they had the this huge display of different tone woods uh and tone woods from america and thing and and just the challenges of finding a big enough slab of of maple for example to make uh-huh. a base to make a base i mean it's just incredibly challenging and it gets picked over by the violin makers so you're left with maybe not the best wood and it's it's really exciting what's going on out there for bass well and maybe it's going to creep into some of the other instruments because um uh, from what i understand arnold's now making cellos yep yep <laughs> so who knows who knows what will happen yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, cause it's, you know, what all the, I think the problems of wood supply and that sort of thing are exacerbated just cause our instruments are so big, but it's, it's not going to get any better and it's going to start to affect probably everybody. So yeah, it's, a, it's exciting to see what's going on. And, and I just, I think luthiers are cool and I, I love, uh, digging in and figuring out how their minds work. Uh huh. Excellent. But, uh, you've been in, like you've been in Nashville sin almost it's been 20 years at this point right just about just about i remember my first day of work was october 18th 1998 so yeah okay. almost 20 years okay wow so talk about a place probably both in terms of the orchestra and just in general that i'll bet has changed a lot in 20 years i think the last time i was there was 1997 uh okay. I've, I used to play, play in Memphis in this chamber orchestra, the Iris Orchestra. So I've, I've been in oh, okay. Memphis, which is a radically different town, in my opinion, from Nashville. But I, I, I played at some – I though what, what's the history of the hall? Was the, the hall that you guys play in, is it Skirmerhorn? Skirmerhorn? How- Skirmerhorn. Okay. Um, Skirmerhorn Symphony Center. He, Mr. Skirmerhorn, Kenneth Skirmerhorn, was the music director uh, – the National Symphony for many years. He's the guy who hired me twice. Uh, previously, he was music director in uh, Milwaukee and in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. He was a uh, protege of uh, Bernstein. And uh, yeah, so the hall was named in his honor. And unfortunately, he passed away just months before the uh, the hall opened and we had our first concert. So um we basically didn't have a music director and Leonard Slatkin sort of stepped in and was named uh, music advisor. So he was kind of our interim boss for a couple mm-hmm. years while we were, we had guest conductors and so forth. And uh, yeah, so that, that's the hall. It opened, I believe 2005. 
Okay. Okay. So I'd love, cause I, you know, every orchestra probably wishes that they accept, wishes they could get a new hall. And for most, it's just not a reality. And it'd be interesting because you were there for years before the hall. I, I think I played in something, was it War Memorial Auditorium or something like yeah. that? I remember this vast space. Um, and I, I've never seen a concert in, in the new hall, but I've heard it's, it's fantastic. Um, what, what does getting a new hall do to an orchestra? Or what did it do for you guys in the National Symphony? Well, it was really transformative. Mm-hmm. We went from um, playing mostly at Tennessee Performing Arts Center, which is a big concrete barn, basically, a multi-use facility that's still used for operas and ballets because it has uh, everything required for, for staging, those kind of cons- uh, performances. Uh, yeah, so we went from being renters basically to being homeowners Mm -hmm. and that enabled us to schedule rehearsals and concerts, you know, regardless of what else was going on in town, you know, so if Lion King was touring, then we couldn't have a concert that week. So it was, it was a challenge for the managers to, uh, do their jobs. But the the acoustics of the new hall are just amazing, and um, it's just really a, a a joy to to go to work in that space and and hear your colleagues and hear yourself. Uh, it's fantastic to go to concerts there when we have occasion to hear touring orchestras. Um, and it's what else does it do? It Gosh, I, I just got to say the, the acoustics make the music making way better. Yeah. And and just having a, a place to keep your stuff. You know, I have a locker <laughs> <laughs> where I keep my bass. It's amazing. I have a locker where I can keep my suit. So yeah. uh, it, it just a, it's a, the quality of life is uh, is vastly improved when the orchestra has their own hall. Well, it's amazing what what things like that do for just overall morale of the group. Having played in groups where you're you're bringing your stuff every day, you know, and it's hot in the car or cold in the car, versus having having a space, having a locker. Um, th- so those might seem like small things to to people that aren't in that world, but I, I don't know. I think that all those things contribute greatly to cohesiveness, feeling like a team, and that 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 seems to me at least to to affect the music making as well. Wow. Oh, you're right on the money. And actually, there's one other thing, and that is recording. Oh, yeah. You know, when you have your own space that sounds amazing, and you already have microphones hanging from this from the ceiling and set up, and you can bring in some other ones, you can record live concerts. You can have a just a dedicated master recording session, and you can put out CDs. I think this is one of the reasons that the National Symphony now has. 13 Grammys. Right. Because it's just really easy to record. You just get everybody in the room and someone hits, hits the button. What, you know, I, that I'd love to know how, cause I was just subbing with the Oregon symphony, which is a great, great group. Lo- uh, love that group. Not, not necessarily the greatest hall. I think they would agree. And, and then getting a hall, um, for you guys, did it change the way the orchestra played? I mean, I'm sure I'm sure the orchestra sounded great even in not in your own space. Um, but then you get this acoustically great space. Did it change the way I don't know the w- wind players play, the bass section play, the orchestra as a whole played? I think so. I think so. Um, now these kind of changes happen slowly. Yeah, but. I think from a bass perspective, going from a super kind of dry and unflattering space, the bass section, I think, I think previously we we had to work harder Okay. and that, that leads to bad habits, maybe not the most tasteful kind of, um, Activity, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, yep. And w- when you have a, a really friendly acoustic environment that just kind of 
naturally enhances what you're doing. You can play in a, in a much more relaxed, easy way. Um, so instead of, I'll put it on some other terms, instead of blasting, you can play with a more resonant kind of aesthetic, mm-hmm. if, that, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. It totally so makes sense. You don't sense. have to work hard. You don't have to work hard. And and I, I, that's just from a base perspective. And, you know, the Skirmhorn's not a bass boomy kind of place. It's, it's, it doesn't really accentuate the bass, but it, it, it's clear and it's, and it's honest and it's definitely, definitely there. Um, yeah. So but that in a nutshell. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's remarkable, uh, not having to feel like you have to overplay to, to fit that because doing something like that, you know, eight services a week, uh, hours on end, that can that can take a toll on your body. That can you can develop bad habits, not listening as well. So I'm sure, what what a cool experience to to be there before that, and then to obviously, uh, but it, it's a lot of fun going to work in a place like that. I, I can imagine. Oh, it sure is, it sure is, and I, th- I think we all feel, especially those of us who have seen the before as well as the after, we feel very. Very fortunate. Uh, Colstein Music has been supplying the bass world and the music world in general at this point with great services and products for over 60 years. It was started by Samuel Colstein and has been run by Barry Colstein, who I've had on the podcast. And, and they are just such a great company for Anything you need for basses. They've got a great selection of instruments. They've got a great selection of bows, accessories, and just a great bunch of people working behind the scenes. Barry has been a true friend to the bass community for so long, and it's so great to have Colstein supporting the podcast. Learn more about everything that they do at Colstein.com. Hi, my name is Andres Martin. I'm an Argentinian composer and double bass player living in Tijuana, Mexico. I play in a professional orchestra, also teaching and performing as a soloist in festivals around the world. After trying almost every string set in the market for the last 20 years, I found Kaplan string to be the only ones that can allow me to use all the different colors and techniques I've been working at during my entire career. I use both solo and orchestral sets, and I love the tone, tension, thickness, and the wide range of dynamics and harmonic resonance and timbre I can get with them. For me, they have the perfect balance between thickness and flexibility, making them a true pleasure under my fingers and bow. I'm happy that finally I have a set that makes me happy when I have to play in any situation. So, you know, someone listening to that, we got people listening all over the place. Um, uh, you hear the word Nashville and country music's the first thing that probably pops to mind. Um, but obviously there's much more than that going on. You're, you know, a, a great example and everybody in the Nashville symphony, um, is, is it still predominantly a country music town? What's the music scene just like in general? It's gotta be one of the most unique places musically in the United States? Wow. That's a great question. Um, there is definitely a lot going on. It it, it is music city is more than country music city. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, that this is probably the, the epicenter of country music because of the publishing and and recording and, and the the business end of, of it. Um, Let's see, what else is going on in Nashville besides country music and, and classical music? Uh, there is a lot of recording mm-hmm. that still happens. There was a heyday, I guess, probably in the 70s and 80s, where a lot of string players and classical musicians were used in a lot of commercial recordings. Uh, this still goes on, but it, from what I can tell, it's more video games and film scoring, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of musicians are, are working and staying busy doing, doing that kind of thing. Uh, there are tons of venues, so there are touring acts all the time. This would be rock and roll, jazz, jam bands, stuff like that. Um, 
as far as uh, jazz goes, I think Nashville has been kind of notorious for having a, a small jazz audience, a smaller jazz audience, maybe some other cities, but I think that's, that's changing. Um, there's a, a new, a new club that was opened up called Rudy's and that's, uh, kind of in conjunction with the, with the Wooten brothers, they're involved with that. Nice. So, you know, I think, yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the musical appetite in, in Nashville is, is changing and, you know, I don't want to say becoming more sophisticated, but it, it's not just, um, telecasters and steel guitars although right. that's really fun too if you right. go down to go down to one of the honky tonks in the touristy section of uh broadway and you're going to hear some world-class talent mm-hmm. um very underappreciated working for tips and which is kind of sad but fantastic musicians for sure and and such a great – such an interesting bunch of bass players that make Nashville their home. A lot of it's got to be uh, these people that are involved in – whether you want to call it the acoustic music or bluegrass or, or newgrass or whatever. But I mean, man, like v- Victor Wooten. Uh, uh, I was just chatting with Ethan Yojevitz, who I know is out of Nashville. Uh, Edgar? Doesn't Edgar Meyer live in Nashville too? He does. He does. Man, what a cra- – and, and I could probably name another half dozen if I think about it. But it's such a it, – it's it's home to a whole lot of super interesting artists. It's just such a – seems like such a unique and exciting creative energy musically in general, but then also on the bass end of thing. It must be really fun to be a bass player in that town right now. Well, I think it's just it, – it's fantastic. That, I mean it shows what a kind of a fertile environment we have – that can support that many different individuals and different kinds of music. You mentioned that, that fellow Ethan. Yeah. Yojevitz. Mm-hmm. We must be talking about the same guy, but uh, I th- actually it was Tim Pearson said, Hey, this guy, Ethan is playing at the, at the five spot, which is this, this really cozy little rock and roll club um, near me. And I, I'd never heard of this guy. So we, we go out and, and check it out a bunch of us it was fantastic it, it like blew my mind the guy was yeah. amazing and just the, the fact that you can walk a couple blocks from your house and hear some world-class kid just you know blow blow the room away is and, and it's like somebody that you've never heard of yeah. before i think that was uh that was really a pleasant surprise yeah it shows you it shows you how how exciting uh the music scene, but also the bass scene is, and and that guy, Ethan, man, I mean, he was on that traditional classical path, you know, he was working on his Heldenleben and his Badazini Uh number two and, and kind of, kind of um, went to Ithaca college for a bit and then transferred into Curtis. And Uh uh, it's just such a, such a fast, you know, from that, that path that so many of us have been on and he's branched off into this totally. I think he's on the road, 200 plus days a year uh, playing with Sierra Hull and do- a ton of other people. Wow. Uh, cool. Cool guy. Well, so I, I, I'd love to speak of like journeys. Uh, take me on the journey, Joel. You grew up in Pennsylvania. <laughs> how'd, how'd you get into bass? Uh, okay. T- 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 oh, t- gosh. T- tell, tell me uh, in, in as, as much detail as you like, uh, how, how'd you end up being principal bass of the National Symphony? Well, okay. Well, I don't want to bore you, but I, I know you can you can probably edit this. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm from a small Appalachian town in Pennsylvania. Uh, I like to say that between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, you have Alabama, mm-hmm. and I'm from the the Pittsburgh Alabama state line. If you can imagine that. Uh, <laughs> so not not a lot of music in schools. Um, the town was pretty small, maybe 1500 people, uh, at least an hour from Pittsburgh. Um, but I had, I have an older brother. He's about 12 years older than me who had a really nice Olympic white Fender jazz bass that he played in some rock bands and stuff. So I kind of got interested in the bass just because it was there and, mm-hmm. and I liked my brother. 
And uh, so I, you know, maybe when I was about 12 or 13, music started becoming uh, more interesting to me, more interesting than just the, the piano lessons that I had taken for a couple of years. So started noodling around on the bass, the electric bass. I could already read music. So I just got some Mel Bay book at the store and kind of started putting two and two together. And I thought, oh, this is I, – I really I really like this. I was jamming with my friends, a good buddy who was a drummer. And uh, so kind of started out that way. Um, in the meantime, my parents were big classical music fans, so we had a lot of records. We went into Pittsburgh Symphony Concerts kind of regularly or the smaller orchestra of the Westmoreland Symphony, which was in Greensburg, which is in Greensburg and mm -hmm. is closer to home. So that was always there. And I remember it was one night I was at home, maybe about 13. And my, my father said, Hey, hey the Pittsburgh Symphony is giving a, a simulcast on the radio of, I don't know what it was. Some, Tchaikovsky or some standards. And so at eight o'clock, turn on the radio and by coincidence, he had the score. So I just started following the score and listening to the music. And I was naturally attracted to the bass line because I'd been playing the electric bass for a couple months and I could read the, read the part. And it, I remember thinking, Oh, this looks pretty easy. I think I could do this. <laughs> Little did I know uh, that it was a, a little more involved in that. Right. Um, so I believe it was ninth grade. Then it was the beginning of ninth grade. I went into the band director, who I can remember his his name. It was Mr. Stoner. I went into Mr. Stoner's office and said, "My name's Joel, and I want to play the bass." And I noticed that in the uh, storeroom on the third floor there are two basses. Could you please get one of those so I could learn to play it? Something like that. Uh, no response. So a couple times a week I went in to Mr. Stoner and gave him the same uh, ask. And finally, it must I, I think it was in February of ninth grade, I came down and finally there was a K bass in the band room just so I would stop irritating him. <laughs> and it was had green lichen growing on the strings. The bridge was a total disaster. Uh, he, I was thrilled. He gave gave me a cello bow. He went to the blackboard and he drew a down bow symbol. He said, "This is down bow. You move it this way." And he drew an up bow. And he said, "This is an up bow. You move it that way." Good luck. <laughs> nice. So then we then my parents started asking around for somebody to give me some instruction, and well, there was a rumor that the the town dentist played in a in a dance band, and so we asked the dentist if if the the bass player in the dance band could could help me, but uh, that bass player didn't want to give anybody lessons. I guess maybe he was kind of an amateur, so it was it was hard to find somebody to to show me around the instrument. But we ended up uh, finding a young guy who had just graduated from New England Conservatory. His name was Robert Skavronsky. And uh, he was a freelancer in Pittsburgh, from Pittsburgh. And, and he gave me lessons for a couple of years through high school and uh, really helped me out um, and pointed me towards Tony Bianco, who he had studied with. So I'm coming from a small town. My parents don't know anything about music schools, what's, what's a good school. Um, the logical thing to do would be to go to the nearest city and uh, try to study with my teacher's teacher. And so that's basically how I ended up studying with, with uh, Mr. Bianco, as we called him. <laughs> and that was fantastic. Um, and then from there, uh, ended up being very fortunate and studied with Paul Ellison at Rice and again, was very fortunate and got into New World and then was very fortunate to get a job. I can fill in any details along the way if you like, but that's that's basically how that happened. 
Wow. So some serious small town roots. That's I, I, I love that. I've, I've never seen lichen growing on strings, but I, I can, I can imagine, I can totally see it uh, happening. That thing had not been played probably in 25 or 30 years. <laughs> Uh, what was what was Mr. Bianco? What was Mr. Bianco like as a teacher? What were those lessons like? Okay, well, uh, Tony. He would like mm-hmm. he would probably like me to call him Tony, but we always called him Mr. Bianco. A very very nice man. Yeah. Uh, old school, old school. Um, just because of the generation that he was part of I mm-hmm. believe he was born in the in the late teens in New Haven and really grew up in New York I think that's where his early musical life was but very nice man um, as I said old school but also very active in the ISB mm-hmm. and very interested in new trends in performance and teaching so I think it was one of my very first lessons. He gave me the Raboth book one and said, well, this, this is what they're doing now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So cool. it's, it's great. I mean, you have somebody who was a substitute in uh, the NBC orchestra with Toscanini, somebody who was Reiner's principal in Pittsburgh and, and so on saying, yeah, there's, we, we got to continue to, to evolve and, uh, and, take on the the new observations so nice. it, it was very traditional you know there was there was definitely Samandel. i think we p- played every every page in Samandel book one and probably most of Samandel, uh, Samandel book two not that that's very exciting right. but it was thorough lots of etudes um from the you know german czech uh tradition and Standard solos, um, as I mentioned, Raboth. So he, he was, you know, the first one to show me how to pivot with the left hand. Um, and he was also very into uh, a certain kind of intonation. And I guess he would refer to as, as just intonation. And he, he demonstrated something that, was, that really uh, stuck with me. He would he would say, okay, I'm going to play a play a D, or I'm going to play an open A on the bass, and I want you to play an E a fifth above it, and find that the sweetest, you know, most resonant in tune fifth. Okay, mm-hmm. and then he would take a little piece of chalk, and and mark where your finger was, maybe the leading edge of your finger, and then he would um, take another note, say for example. Uh, a G or maybe he would take a, a tuner and, and play a, a tempered C or play a tempered C on the piano and then have you play an E with that and find the sweetest, most resonant in tune E natural. And then you would, you would observe where your finger was on the fingerboard. And with a 42 inch string length, that those differences can be almost a centimeter. Wow. So, so it, it really kind of, uh, blew my mind that playing in tune is not about uh, this absolute point on the fingerboard, like on a like a like on a guitar or a fretted mm-hmm. instrument. It's really, especially on the bass, which with a larger string length, it's 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 a matter of uh, finding the the spot that sounds best, not the spot that is geographically absolute. There's probably a better way to 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 uh, communicate that, but it, it's something that might not help you when you're playing by yourself so much because, you know, ultimately you just want to find the best sounding intonation. But when you're playing in an ensemble that doesn't have a keyboard in it, it, it really is helpful. And um, one one time that this really helped me was when I had a, a C extension for the first time, mm-hmm. and I was playing Messiah, and there were some passages with one bass and, and one cello, and I had to play the low C, and it was totally out of tune with the cello. 
and it was it was shocking how awful it was. And I thought, well, I tuned my my C extension to a tuner. Uh-huh. It's uh, it should be in tune. <laughs> well, but then I thought, okay, well, let's think how the the fellow with with the cello tuned his his C. Well, he tuned it against his G and made a nice fifth, in which he had tuned against his his D and made a nice fifth, and so on. So I just moved the nut on that C extension quite a bit lower so that it sounded nice against my open G and then the problem was solved. And, and mm. I said, thank you, Mr. Bianco for that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was one thing that he was, he was really into. And another thing um, was solfege. He was a solfege fiend. Um, I wish more of it rubbed off on me, but this guy could solfege the Bodicini ter- Tarantella. I mean, he, old school uh, music education. He had a bass teacher. He didn't go to college. He had a, a bass teacher who was one of the NBC uh, bass players, Sam Levitan. And he had a solfege teacher who was a former student, Respighi. And that was his, that was, that was his music education. That was his master's degree. Wow. How cool is yeah. that? <laughs> very, very cool. Very, very cool. I have such admiration for people with those mad solfege skills. I remember uh, doing a few concerts with Pierre Boulez, and that, that was one of his, you know, uh, kind of parlor tricks, if you will. You just hear him, like, like you know, whip off some violin passage in solfege. It's it's uh, it's got to be such a helpful thing if 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 you uh, are trained in that way. And it, it seems to be a little bit of a lost art. Yeah. Um, not that they, the the aural skills aren't being taught and developed, uh, of course, but um, that almost second language it seems to be falling out of favor somewhat. Yeah, yeah, it's too it's it's too bad. I I I, I can't wait to try out that uh, just intonation technique. That's a that's a that's a great idea to market with chalk like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna give that a shot with some of my students because it's it and yeah, doing it on the bass. You're right, having such a long string length, it's it it makes it all the more obvious versus say violin or something like that, just visually. Right. Yeah, a violin yeah. is is going to be aware of those things, but it's not going to be such a a big physical consideration. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and he, and he would all he would also talk about uh, how whole steps would be of different sizes. Um, and you know, I, we could probably get super nerdy about this, but uh, the the gist of it is that between on a major scale between degrees one and two that whole step is a little larger than two to three so if you're playing a if you're playing a whole step above the tonic you're going to find that it's going to sound better if if you play a little higher than than tempered pitch and then the next um, whole step is a little smaller so ends up with the third being a little a little lower uh i don't know how much we need to think about that but it's it's good just to be aware of where those few tendencies are going to uh, make a big difference for sure for sure and even if you're even if you're not focusing on it it's got to have an impact on where you're putting the pitch in the orchestra too uh which most of the time you're you're not playing with a piano i guess piano concerto or some repertoire but you're you're probably aware to some degree of that of that uh sitting there in the bass section leading the bass section i think so i i, I don't think it's something that you think about a lot but right. if, if there's if you notice a problem then that might help you, uh, might give you a clue as to where the solution would be. (laughs) This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violins. For more than 40 years, over four decades, Robertson and Sons has specialized in providing the highest quality string instruments and bows to collectors, professional musicians, music educators, and students of all ages. Their modern facility, which is totally beautiful, by the way, if you're ever able to make it out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I highly recommend it. They have a recital hall that they use not only for performances, but it's available to their clients. So if you want to try out a fine pedigree bass or even a student bass or anything in between, you can go in that recital hall. I've had the chance to do that. Totally amazing. I'm like a kid in the candy store when I'm down there at Robertson's. Check them out online at robertsonsviolins.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. 
This episode is brought to you by the Upton Bass String Instrument Company, a company that I have been such a fan of over the years. Gary and Eric and all the good folks at Upton, they do extraordinary work. They've been at it for a long time, and it has been so much fun to watch them evolve over the years. And a question they get asked a lot is, what's the difference between their Bohemian model bass and their standard model basses. And basically what it boils down to is they, they come from the same basic outline, but there's much more customization available in a Bohemian bass. So Upton standard basses basically look like each other. They're either laminate, hybrid, or carved, but they're similar in their form. While you can get your Bohemian bass customized, if you want hat peg tuners, if you want all sorts of other details, that that's the base you can customize. And if you haven't been to the Upton website recently, they're constantly adding new videos, new photos, new descriptions, and every base has a story. And I love following along with these stories. Visit them at UptonBase.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast. And, and how cool that he was into Rabat as well. You know, that traditional uh, uh, tr training that that's that's not everybody uh of that generation was so open to new ideas and especially i i, I feel like robot is something that even maybe the last 10 10 years uh or so it, you don't get a raised eyebrow uh if you start talking about francois but i mean even w when i was in in we're, we're around the same age when i was in college that was still uh, where i went um looked at a, with a little bit of uh maybe suspicion <laughs> uh -huh. and then go and then going and working with Paul, who obviously is so closely associated with Francois and just can't say enough good things about Paul. Um, that, that what, what made you uh, pick, right? I mean, obviously great, great choice, great teacher. What, what drew you to rice? And then what was your experience like there and working with Paul? Well, that that's kind of interesting too, because, you know, while I was in Pittsburgh, I was still, very much a small time bass player from the backwoods of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and uh, there was a, there's a guy in Pittsburgh, a fantastic jazz musician named a uh, bass player named Dave, David Pello. And I believe for a while he was the Carnegie Mellon jazz band director after my time. Uh, but he was really into Raboth and, and, uh, and so on. And the new trends, and I believe he had taken some summer courses, maybe with Raboth or Paula Ellison. So he said to me, my junior year, he said, "Joel, you should go to this Grand Teton orchestral seminar, mm -hmm. which was basically a, the student version, uh, the student school at the Grand Tetons." And he said, "And go study with Paul Ellison." And I had never heard of Paul Ellison. Um, I'd, I'd heard of Raboth, and uh, and I actually I was using a bent end pin at the time. Oh wow! Yeah, probably because uh, Dave Pello recommended it. So I, uh, Dave Pello said, "I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you this show, this uh, this gig. I'm going to give you this gig. You play this show for a week or two, and you're going to make a couple hundred bucks. I'll give you this show, but only if you tr if you try to go to this festival." So I said, "Okay, deal." And <laughs> so I. So I got into the festival and had a couple hundred bucks from Dave Pello's gig, and I go there, and Paul Ellison walks into the room and introduces himself, and the next three weeks completely, completely blew my mind. I, I, I mean, what he was showing us, I had, I had no idea. I had no idea. Uh, it, it was like the mysteries of the base were being so solved and explained in just the most clear, logical, easy manner. And at the, at the end of the, uh, towards the end of the festival, I, I thought, Oh, that, I could really get a lot <laughs> more out of this guy, obviously. And so I said, well, you know, how good would I have to be to, to study with you in, in grad school. He said, well, you know, I mean, you know, Paul's very nice. It's, well, right. you know, maybe kind of how you are, keep in touch. Mm -hmm. And so it worked out. It worked out. And uh, thank goodness, because that I would have, I would have no career if it wasn't for, for him. Yeah. 
And what what a, what a teacher and some of those mysteries of the base uh, revealed. I I would be a, I would be a negligent interviewer if I didn't ask a follow up question, which is maybe what were some of those mysteries that you discovered with Paul about about the base? I mean, just r- basics, mm-hmm. remedial basics, but uh, but so important. Straight bow, yeah. Flat hair. Mm-hmm. Your mm-hmm. left hand moves before the the bow. Shifting technique. Uh, I mean, just just the basics. I mean, it's it's just it's just basic science how how the thing how the thing works how to use your body efficiently that's probably the the biggest thing from him um how to how to leverage efficiently mm-hmm. um how to work less yeah working less equals easy uh, and just some some good some some good psychological advice on how to just deal <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that 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 and and the Tony Bianco and you're working with him. That's got to have carried over into your own teaching. Um, how could it not? I hope so. Yeah, right. So, um, what uh, what are some? I, I love asking this to people. I know you teach at Vanderbilt, and you work with people probably in all sorts of capacities as a as a teacher too. What are some of the things that you see people struggling with the most uh, when they come to play for you, whether it's as an undergrad or coming through and playing some excerpts for you or in whatever situation, like what are, what are some of the, if, if any commonalities that you see young bass players, older bass players struggling with big question. Sorry. <laughs> that's a, that's a great question. I mean, man, you could, you could just, you could pick a, uh any any number of things but yeah. if if it would come to um say excerpts i would say one of the things that i i see all the time and this is um listening to auditions too mm-hmm. and I've, I've been on a number of them at the at the national symphony it, it's people uh trying to play too loud i, I mean it's just it's it's all over the place, you know. In in Beethoven, if it's a if it's one F, people are giving like maximum effort, mm-hmm. um, and it just it often doesn't sound good. Uh, so I, I would just advise bass players, especially ones who are um, looking to play with orchestras, if you develop your your lower end of the dynamic. Mm. Uh, spectrum, it, it, it's going to be a better service to you. Because if you have a decent, big, full sound, that's great. And there's only there's only so much that that you can give in a fortissimo. And a fortissimo is kind of a, a little special. But if it's just one F, just relax and, and play with a with a good, rich, big sound. But don't overdo it. Conversely, if you have a really beautiful pianissimo you're going to endear yourself to your stand partner and uh, <laughs> yeah. you'll, you'll get tenure. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's one thing that I think um, bass players who are, are working on their, their presentation and their general skills would be well advised to, to consider yeah, it's almost like a like a law of diminishing returns. Sometimes when you're putting, you, you think you think you're powering more sound, but you're just choking the instrument. Um, both for both for arco playing, and I also was chatting with Larry Grenadier, the great jazz bassist, about that. And it's like if you if you pull too hard, pits too hard, you can almost have the same effect too. But certainly for the bow, like I wonder why people. Uh, I wonder why that's such a common thing. Do you think it's psychological or people freaking out or is it that they're practicing in too small a space and then they get into a big hall and they force? I wonder why that's so common. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think what you, everything you mentioned is probably a factor. Uh-huh. It, it could also be that a lot of those big passages that we have are also in the, in the low brass. So yeah. in our, in our mind's ear, we're hearing this, you know, epic trombone section 
and we're trying to re- replicate that yeah. on, on one base and it, it it's not, it's not going to happen. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Yeah. And it, it's interesting that you mentioned pizzicato because that is another area where I think every bass player should do some some serious study and experimentation because a lot of great bass players don't have as beautiful pizzicato as they could. And I mean, I've actually almost been tempted uh, to put a, a pizzicato passage on a, on the next symphony audition. Not that I'm not satisfied with any of my colleagues pizzicatos, but y- you want to be sure that um, people are p- playing the instrument in in every manner that it's asked to be played in, and yeah. and the, and pizzicato is such a big part of our role, right? <laughs> How much of our lives do we spend playing pizzicato actually in the orchestra, right? It's a pretty high percentage. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Wow. So what okay, so what um what constitutes a good Orchest- or a good set of orchestral pizzicatos. What? What? Um, because I've actually chatted with circling back to Scott Pingle. I've actually chatted with Scott about this, and he's got some. He's got especially for louder pizzicatos. He has this interesting technique where he actually pitches closer to his left hand. Um, uh-huh. and 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 it's it was remarkable how the sound jumps out. But I I see almost nobody doing that in practice. So like, what what are you looking for uh, in pizzicato, or what what constitutes a good pizzicato uh in an orchestral setting for you well i mean i think the idea is to have a variety Mm -hmm. um and you know a pizzicato has has two big components and that's the the front of the sound the the ping and then the Mm -hmm. ring uh so you want to play with the the appropriate sound for the the music that you're playing um that technique that you're that you mentioned playing closer to the, to the left hand, I think that's great when you need a lot of uh, attack. Yeah. Because it's, it really has a lot of front to it. Um, I don't know, big, beautiful, resonant. Um, that's that's kind of what I like to go for. Uh, I think most of us like. Um, I don't know if you want to know about specifics on how to do it. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, that people would love that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's all it's very simple. You know, I play German bow, so um, I, I figured out a way to keep the tip of my bow on the treble side of the bridge. Mm-hmm. If I have to be, be going back and forth between pits and arco, this was a big struggle for me for a long time, uh, going fast pits to to arco. But I finally figured it out. Keep the Tip your bow on the treble side, um, so you're really you're ready to go. Uh, get get if you want just a, a kind of my go-to pizzicato would be to get a lot of the uh, index right index finger, a lot of the flesh on the string, and mm-hmm. pull it pull it down and out, and feel a good feel a lot of the resistance and a good pop, good release. So that you're not um, – and doing it in a way so that you're not getting noise. You want mm-hmm. to get a lot of pitch and not noise. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to hear a lot of slapping unless it's asked for. Well, and as as somebody who like these days, I you know I'm I'm walking as a sub with different groups. And the, the in addition to getting a good sound, of course, my thought is, my goodness, I hope I can play together <laughs> with this you know this uh, bass section I don't know with this principle that I don't usually play with. Um, can you just talk to me because I think it's an interesting topic, uh, 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 like about. How do you how do you know where to play the pizzicato? How do you does it vary conductor by conductor? Um, what should someone in the section be watching? Uh, these are the things I think we bassists spend a lot of time pondering in the section. Okay, wow, that's great. Um, I have the good fortune of playing in a bass section that plays pizzicatos so incredibly well together. It is. It is never an issue, and I'm not. I don't know why. Um, I will have to say our music director, uh, Giancarlo Guerrero, is extremely clear, and that that is a huge part of it. With pizzicatos, there's in 
in my mind, there's really no doubt when to play it. And if I had to describe it, I would just say it's – it probably varies orchestra by orchestra, but in general, this orchestra plays just – just a tiny bit after the um, the conductor's I don't know what's what's the term ictus you know yeah. so they, the bottom of their beat it's just on the rebound okay um, you know I've I've seen videos and I've seen orchestras that play magically way behind I'm yes. thinking of some of the big European orchestras the conductor gives the 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 click right here click and then boom and it's just magically together way behind. Uh, I think that's just that's just a a vibe. It's just a spidey sense kind of thing that we right. that we uh, clue into. But for us, it's it's that too. But it's just just right after the the uh, the beat. So it's it's pretty simple and and easy to anticipate. Mm-hmm. I sometimes um, I like to show a little bit of the rhythm just in my body language without being yeah. obnoxious. Um, so that I can help give people some confidence. Uh, and I found that taking a breath at the right moment before helps me to do it a little more automatically and less intellectually. If that That's makes sense. That, to- that totally makes sense. And what a beautiful thing that the, that the section, the vibe of the section is together pizzicatos. That's yeah. You don't want, that's uh that's a, that is not always the case. Um, so that that's cool. And so with a conductor who's clear like that, uh, watching, watching both, I'm sure they're watching you, but then they're also able to watch the conductor and have a pretty, uh, uh, be, be, uh, fairly certain that they know where they're supposed to be playing. Yeah, I think so. I don't even think they're really watching me so much. I mean, I think they're kind of just have an eye on their stand partner. So it's a little bit of a, you know, we're all kind of in the same, matrix or kind of all meshed in there together uh, oh and, and speaking of of breathing uh, i've found that that is a great way to get a good sound on a pianissimo exposed entrance uh, probably lots of bass players have figured this out too but if i i found that if i do that on an exhale my tone is so much better than if i'm uptight and holding my breath for instance Fascinating. I wonder why. I mean, I've, I've, I've totally experienced that too. I wonder why that is. I wonder if it's just, I guess maybe it just goes back to music coming from the voice or something. And like by, even though we don't have to breathe, maybe there's something in our, in our DNA that just, I, I don't know. Well, I think it's, I think it's um, probably a little more physical than that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that our bodies just work better. I mean, obviously, when you're relaxed, and exhaling is a re- an act of relaxation. Yeah, I think so. I, 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 that would probably be my explanation. But it works. It works. Yeah, for sure. All right, I got to ask you. I saw. I, the, I, I try to find anything I can online about people before I chat, and you got a couple of interview clips, and there's something up on the website, and there was a story you told, which I found very entertaining, and I'll just see if you remember it. If I just say rubber chicken, do you know the story? Oh, I, oh man, <laughs> would you mind that sharing is... that? That's a very fun story. <laughs> oh, that is a, a great moment in Nashville <laughs> Symphony lore. Okay, this is back in the old days in T Pack. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we are we are playing a piano concerto with uh, forget the soloist's name, wonderful soloist. And so we had our rehearsals, and they were heading into the first concert. Con, uh, soloist takes a bow, sits down at the piano, is preparing to play. The conductor is looking at the soloist, nodding. The soloist is looking at the conductor, nodding. But then the the soloist notices something in the piano <laughs> in the in the the gears of the piano and uh gets up on his stool looks in notices something his face looks he looks perplexed he puts his hand inside the piano and pulls out a rubber chicken <laughs> and 2000 people just just lose it they were just laughing <laughs> hysterically all the musicians we couldn't believe it either so i i don't know what he did with the rubber chicken maybe just laid it down next to him so and then we got on with the concert. So it turns out that some of the stagehands 
we're just playing a joke on each other <laughs> earlier in the afternoon, setting up the concert, and uh, they forgot their, to, take, to take their rubber chicken out. <laughs> but <laughs> that's probably, that is probably the funniest thing that's ever happened on stage for me. Yeah, I, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> I can't. I can't believe you were able to play the con. That they were able to go on with the concert. <laughs> Must have taken a couple it, minutes to regroup. It probably <laughs> took a, a little bit for people to calm down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I I super appreciate you chatting with me. This is super fun. I I'd love to d- do it again sometime live. Uh, you know, uh, I'll be in Nashville one of these days. I know it's been twenty years, but I, I I usually wrap up with some sort of advice for your younger self. Um question like if you could go back and chat with joel just as he was about to start uh carnegie mellon um now here you are principal base of nashville you've done all these interesting things professionally and um what what advice might you give uh 17 18 year old joel uh knowing what you know now well first of all i would tell him to get a haircut okay (laughs) lose the mullet lose the mullet (laughs) <laughs> uh, no, it's seriously, I actually, I would, I would tell him, um, quality over quantity. Don't worry about practicing so much, but just practice smarter. Mm-hmm. Uh, younger Joel wasted so much time just putting in the time. And mm-hmm. I mean, certainly admirable to put in lots of hours, but, um, you can avoid injury and you can progress faster if, if you're, if you're smart about how you practice. Yeah. Uh, it's one thing that, that took me a little while to learn. Uh, and I, I'm still learning it. Uh, but I, I think that would have, that advice would have helped me quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish I could tell young Jason that I too spent many, too, many hours banging my head against the wall on things that didn't amount to a hell of beats. There you go. Thank you so much for chatting. And folks, conversations like this make me realize just how small the base world is. All these mutual acquaintances and friends that we have in common that we talked about from Tim Pearson and Paul Ellison to Scott Pingle. It's a really exciting world, this this base world. And I just so appreciate you listening to this. I know Joel appreciates it. And this is base community. This is what we do as base players. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I, I think there's a reason why this podcast has resonated with so many people and why of all the instruments bass is the one that's got 500 plus podcast episodes it's because we're a community folks we love learning and growing together and that's what i hope we were doing here today i certainly felt so i get so much out of these conversations and i hope you did as well If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast and you haven't yet, all that information is available on our website, ContraBaseConversations.com. And you can also reach out to me directly, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com. I'd love to hear from you. ContraBase Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And if you're looking for some bass work or a new bass, Mitch is just east of Dallas, Texas. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. I'm your host, Jason Heath, coming to you from San Francisco, California. We'll see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Uh